Hello and welcome everyone to uh, to LPM Tiger Team 2023. I appreciate you all joining us this morning. For those of you who haven't joined uh, our series so far, Tiger Team is a is a problem solving series of webcasts where we use LPM market research to understand key challenges in SME legal, and we use one of these webcasts to bring together. Uh, panelists from with a diverse range of expertise, mostly SME legal leaders um, and the, also known as Tigers, uh, to try and solve some of the key business challenges. Um, episode one was about core tech and whether it's linking to strategic outcomes and how best to make the most of uh, how to identify a firm's core tech and and to make the most of it. Uh, today's episode is a uh, episode two is about automation, closing the automation gap. So LPM Frontiers Research in for the past many years has said that SME law firms understand the potential that automation has for their business and how much value it could bring. But still, every year, survey after survey reveals that they haven't quite reached the mark that they want to with automation. And there's a big gap there. We're trying to understand today um, why that gap exists um, what and what we can do to solve it. And that's what we have our Tigers with us for today. Um, just a quick note before, quick few notes before we start. A uh, big thank you to our partners for this series, Net Documents. Um, I also wanted to quickly note that uh, before we introduce our panel and our partner, uh, that this session is being recorded today. Um, and the reason I say that is because for those of you who want to join the discussion, we'll be having a, a discussion throughout the course of the hour. But if you want to join in or chip in with ideas or thoughts or comments or questions, uh, please do use the Q&A section of the of the Zoom webinar to 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 contribute, and I'll try and come around to as many of your comments as possible. I'll just come to introducing our tigers, but before that, could I just hand over to Mike Kay, who's a senior solutions expert from Net Documents, to really give us set the scene and introduce the session for us today. Yeah, thank you very much, Haftab, and good morning to everyone. Firstly, thank you all for taking the time out of your day to, to join the session. Um, this is just as useful for us from a, a supplier perspective as, of course, it is for you as, as lawyers or, or law firms. Um, uh, automation is a huge area of focus for us, uh, as it is, I'm sure, for all suppliers to the legal industry at the moment. And uh, I'm very keen to listen to everybody's thoughts and uh, on, on the topics that we've got to discuss today. So um, thank you very much for, for joining. Brilliant. Thank you so much for that, Mike. Um, I'm just going to go around the room and introduce the panel now. So we have, uh, amongst our tags, we have Lindsay Dewitt, who is the practice manager from Th Thomas Flavel and Son. Sorry if I've mispronounced that. Uh, she joined the firm as a practice manager in 2016 and is responsible for a wide range of functions, including the introduction of new technology to streamline processes and improve efficiencies, which hopefully we'll be talking a lot about today. Uh, we have Andrew Figgis, who's the Finance and Ops Director at Talbot's Law. Um, Andrew has over 20 years experience in the legal sector. He has a background in finance as a qualified accountant um, and, a position, uh, and a passion for change and innovation, which drives the constant need to modernize technologies and systems at his firm. Also something we'll be hopefully looking to address today. And last but not least, we have Sean Studdiford, who's the Chief Operations Officer at Thompson Smith & Buxton. Um, Sean is legal C COO with track record of driving change programs and implementing tech solutions. Um, he has spent over 25 years in the professional services uh, sector, and he's committed to creating a culture of learning, excellence and success. A big thank you to all of you for joining us today. Um, all right, without much further ado, I think we're ready to uh, to kick off our discussion on automation today. And I know it's it's something that's doing the round in the news these days, especially with with things that are uh, with with chat GPT three, uh, GPT three and then uh, and all other kinds of uh, discussions around automation. But I just wanted to break this down and bring this in context of SME legal because I think one of the biggest questions firms have is you know what aspects of their operations can they really automate? You know, I mean, the, the big question is, can I automate that? And it can be hard for SME firms that are caught up with all the pressures in their day-to-day -day life to, to really understand, um, you know, what aspects of their uh, of their work is is bespoke and what aspect is commoditized enough for them to to automate it. So I just wanted to firstly pose the question to the to the panel, maybe start with you, Sean, is, is how do you go about trying to look at your uh, your operations and and see what what you can automate. Uh, yeah, it is an interesting question, isn't it? Which is how you know, how can a law firm undertake a gap analysis? Really, um, 
and I can only talk about our experience, probably if, I, if, if my memory serves about 10 years or so ago, um, we undertook such an analysis and we started off looking at identifying the current state of our work uh, and the current state of our position on, uh, I think it's Stephen Mason's commoditized spectrum really, where we decided to place our work down that spectrum, bespoke, standardized, systemized, packaged or commoditized and tried to work out with our hand on our hearts, really honestly, where did it sit on, on that um, sort of spectrum really. Uh, once we'd established that, which by the way, was a controversial thing, um, I'm, I'm speaking about lawyers generally, lawyers tend to estimate that their work is further towards the bespoke end than quite often it could be. Um, and that's always a bit of a cultural challenge as well to, to analyse, but that's a separate question for, for somebody else, I'm, I'm sure. And so I would start with analysing that current state, seeing where we were on the spectrum, placing your work literally almost with post-it notes on, on that spectrum on a board and, and, and have a discussion around that. Then perhaps establish what the desired state really is for, for the practice. Identify that target position on the spectrum based on the firm's strategic goals. What marketplace are you looking for? What market trends are you looking for? Um, and within all of these conversations, we must never really forget um, our clients. What, what are our clients looking for and expecting? And this is why I think it's very difficult on this panel. We'll probably all have a slightly different view depending on the kind of work we do and the kind of client base we have, exactly where our work sits. But there's some really interesting reading from um, futurists like Susskind and Meister, I think, that, that can really help people. I really encourage people to, to do some Googling and some reading in that area to establish your, your, your desired state for your work. Further on from that, I think there's analyzed opportunities for automation. Um, consider the perspectives really of, of where technology is, what the firm wants to achieve and determine the potential for automating um, various legal services really. Look for opportunities where that technology can help enhance quality, accessibility, uh, and particularly really for services closer to the mod commoditized end of the spectrum, which for us in our practice tends to be um, things like our uh, residential property work, where it's a lot more easier to have repetition and automation. Um, debt recovery work is another one that plays really well into the hands of, 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 of uh, automation. Um, then I think we would then take the next step would be to map out really what are the required resources to get from where we are to where we said we wanted to get to. Uh, we'd look at resources, technologies, the skills that were needed, which is quite often a real challenge for SMEs. Do we have the skills internally to drive that forward? And that's where suppliers, I'm sure Mike will talk about how, how they can help do that. Mike, I'm sorry if I'm putting words into your, your mouth there, but I'm sure you probably will. And then look for in opportunities where technology can enhance efficiency, quality, accessibility, um, and particularly kind of bring services closer to the commoditized end of the spectrum. Whereas at the moment, they're sitting more towards the bespoke. Um, other than that, to kind of briefly round through, um, probably just assess the potential risks and challenges, because there will be a trade-off in here with automation and risks and challenges. Um, where you are taking a lawyer's eye potentially off legal work, you've got to assess the risk. So again, we would evaluate the risks that are associated with that transition. And Look at things like, so what would those risks be? Um, I think when we looked, we sat and we talked about client resistance, um, ethical concerns, data security, and of course the uh, ever present and ever larger uh, regulatory compliance issue, um, which uh, I mean, we all have these compliance roles, whether it's COFA, COLP, data protection officer. Um, these are big beasts these days in practices like ours, where we have lots of knowledge and data to handle. and. Uh, those are really uh, risks for us to assess as well. So lots to do in there, but hopefully to summarise, it's identify the current state, establish the desired state, analyse those opportunities, mm -hmm. map out some resources and capabilities, and then really assess potential risks. I think you've touched on so many of the challenges that come after that first step of the gap analysis, but you described that gap analysis really well. But one of the things that you talked about was the, the idea of knowing what your strategic outcomes are, right? And knowing what your business is. So could could I ask in your specific context and if you were automating certain aspects of your work, uh, especially on the more commoditized end of the spectrum, what is your what is the key strategic outcome that you're looking for? Is that efficiency, risk management, is that resource savings? What is the what is the one thing? Uh, the big driver for us at the moment is efficiency, really. Um, recruitment is hard. Resources are hard to come by. Expenses are for all law firms up. And I think if we look at just generally trends that are going on in the industry, 
um, all of our expenses are up proportionately to, to income. I think that's probably fair. So it's really about driving some efficiencies in there that we can then deliver onto the client. It will have side benefits, of course, to clients like um, time. Uh, things will get done done faster, but that in turn knocks onto other challenges around how do we bill, which I'm sure you'll touch on later on. Um, you know, it, it does have implications for billable hour practices if you do this. But yeah, really, really for us, we're looking at driving efficiencies and uh, allowing the lawyers hopefully to focus more on lawyering really and client service and putting customer focus really at the heart of our practice. That's what we're aiming to do right now. Mm -hmm. uh, if I could just yeah come to come to um, Lindsay, maybe you, because uh, I'm just wondering because there is obviously different firms have different mixes of uh, practice areas, different types of work, and obviously as Sean mentioned, they lie on this this scale of bespoke to commoditized. Um, I'm wondering if it, in your firm, if you've been able to identify, you know, do you lie more on the bespoke to, uh, bespoke to commoditized uh, spectrum, and and how you've gone about doing the gap analysis for your for your specific automation needs yeah so we have um, managed to automate a lot of our work in conveyancing and commercial property um but the gap analysis it's identified we have got a gap in um private client where we can't really find the resources or find the technology out there that can automate the process for us um a lot of the work that we've done with um property um on automating the client onboarding, we have delivered across all of the departments. Um, but in terms of the legal work, we can only really find that in commercial property and property at the moment. We're struggling to, to see where um, or what technology is out there to support us in private client and matrimonial. All right, and I'm, I just wanted to, because uh, as you said, you have that automation in the conveyancing space. And when you have- yeah undertaken your journey uh, maybe we can move this further towards um, you know when you did start to identify areas that you could automate um, were there any significant barriers that came up on that in in the in the first instance um yeah definitely so we looked at the client journey from start to finish um in property and identified contracts as an area that we could automate that did take a quite a lot of time to get everyone on board with it um, the way that we approached it was we put in place a few different teams um, that would trial the product for a few months. And then over time, those employees are telling other staff how they're getting on. And it sort of got everybody else on board. Um, and now all of the department used um, automation for the contracts, um, you know, automated electronic signatures. Um, and it, well, the biggest thing for property was putting together the um, property report that saved us probably 45 minutes it used to take um the Viennas around an hour to draft the property report and we're now doing it in 15 minutes using technology and the automation through um, InfoTrack and that's really really helped us mm -hmm. um and you mentioned that I mean obviously you had to kind of roll it out on a and once people saw the benefits that's when uh, adoption yeah. really was driven was that basically the biggest barrier you were trying to overcome was it the people side of it getting people to adopt it yes definitely um I think it's really hard for lawyers to rely on a third party putting something together for them um and until they'd actually seen it working in um you know in pro in process um and watching other fee earners use it having clients feedback um they were then all on board but it, it did definitely take us a while some people were really resistant to it um i think it is key just to get some some staff trial in the product see how the clients react to it um and over time um you know everyone can see that it is actually saving them time and if you can save 45 minutes on, on one element of the process, why wouldn't you do it? Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's, a, I mean, that's one of the biggest, uh, biggest challenges that people do raise when it comes to automation. If I could bring this to you, Andy, is, what, is the fact that, you know, there, there is this cultural barrier, adoption barrier, things like that. And you would think that it's a fairly simple conversation, as Lindsay said. I mean, once it's demonstrated that it is saving time and it is efficient, uh, you would think it's an easy conversation. But is there, uh, where, where where does the barrier come up then, Andy, to to really get people to adopt these systems? And it, or separately, is it is it that they think that their jobs are threatened in some way? 
Well, uh, thanks, Aftab. Um, there's not much been left there, but uh, certainly that last part is sort of where it all, you know, how does it get delivered in the business? And you have got two sides. You've got that that cultural part, and then you've got the the people engagement part as well. So I think culturally as well, so you've got to accept that, um, you know, this investment's required. Um, because I think for a lot of it, you know, we've gone down this case management route and, you know, people have got that automation in place. Mm. And now it's a case of, you know, what's the next thing and, and do I want to invest? So I think from a, from a management perspective, culturally, that's a hard thing. You know, do I want to be doing this? Do I want to invest in that? Is it going to work? You know, is this technology, you know, going to be superseded? I think part of that is we've seen since the way that the legal landscape has changed is you need to invest in technologies because one of the things we're finding harder and harder is, you know, can I find somebody to do the job? And the reality is, yeah, you might be able to find somebody, but, you know, people don't want to be sat there doing admin tasks that can be automated. That's not what they would get into law for. So, you know, from the from the scope, if you've got bespoke all the way down to the commoditized, you know, people don't go into the into a legal role to go, I want to be an admin. I, you know, I, I, want, I want to push around bits of information, you know, God forbid paper, mm-hmm. um, because, you know, that's not a rewarding job. So, you know, you've got to, you've got to deal with that. Um, and I suppose with then the, um, you know, does it threaten my job? I think we're at the moment in legal at the moment where, you know, people are like bursting with the amount of work they've got, you know, so they're over capacity. So I think for a large part of it, it's just trying to, know, you know, get some, you know, air back into the system so that, you know, people have got, you know, they can breathe, they can, they can do their work without being, you know, constantly at breaking point. So I think when you have automation like that, that makes it a lot easier of a sell. Um, and I think personally for us, you know, we've gone on a bit of a growth strategy over the last couple of years. So, Actually, it's given us the ability to, you know, able to complete more work. Um, you know, we're able to, you know, look at bringing in those technologies. People say, I can't do any more than what I've got. You know, it's a struggle at the moment to find, you know, good people. People are trained up to a certain level. So, you know, if you can take the heavy lifting out of it with automation, you know, that's you know, that's great. But I guess then the final part of that is then it's the sell back to the business. You know, what are we going to do to get this, um, you know, in? And I guess these things don't change, you know, the change curve and, and how you flatten it out. You know, people know how to do it. It's just really, you know, when you take on a project for automation, it's like, can I execute that? So, you know, get the early engagement, involve people in the solution, you know, roll it out as a pilot just to make sure it is correct for the business and it can work, you know, sign it off. But it doesn't just stop there. You've then got that ongoing training part, you know, and then it's the, it's review, review, review. Um, because, you know, once you have brought it in, you want to make it a success. So you can't just leave it as is, you know, from when it's brought into the business. You've got to you know, constantly go around that feedback loop and say, if something's not right, you know, let's get it right. But it's um, mm-hmm. that's that's really where it, where it sits. I, speak, I mean, speaking specifically in the context of automation, because obviously the, the, some of the aspects you mentioned, which is change management, adoption, um, that's kind of with every new technology that you roll out in firm that tends to be the challenge is to demonstrate ROI to get adoption. I'm wondering if in your experience, has there been anything unique to automation specifically that has been a, a barrier in those in those areas? So do you mean if any of the technologies have been u- unique? Yeah, compared to other technologies, is automation oh. specifically, does it have something unique within it that makes it uh, even more challenging to drive adoption? I, su- I suppose you've got that part where it comes to threat of jobs. It's probably mm-hmm. the only thing with that. Um, I think with any change, they sort of are the same. When you boil it down, they are the same. But I think it's what's that threat to my role that that can make a you know that can have an impact on people. Um, and I guess once again, it's about communication. Now that is, it's you know it's demonstrating to people what it looks like, how it looks, how it's going to Im- improve your role. Um, and the chances are, as I said, most people don't come to work to do admin tasks. Um, and, and if people do and they're being removed, but and, and that, that's just unfortunate, but I, I don't see much of that from where I currently sit, mm-hmm. uh, lo- looking out into the business. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I'll come to you, Mike, in a second, but I just wanted to pose this to you, Sean, because it seems like there's a bit of a paradox here, because obviously there are people who don't want that admin, you know, the, to be, they don't join law to, be, to do admin. But then on the other hand, if you tell them that you can automate a certain aspect of their role, then it uh, it kind of feels like they're, you're demeaning their, their work in a way. and. Equally, you're also cutting the amount of time that they're spending on a particular case, which which has a direct bearing on profitability. So is that a conversation that you've had to have uh, within your firm? It, it is, and, and it's on, an ongoing one, actually. It, it hasn't ended for us. I, I think that resistance to change that Andy has brought up there, which is largely about addressing traditional mindsets within the legal profession. Um, one of the things that we've tried to do successfully in some places, and sometimes I'm sure not successfully, is about promoting a growth mindset 
one one that really embraces some change and innovation and we've done that really with utilizing our, our legal network while sharing success stories from other adopters of technology um we happen to be a law net firm um and and that's quite a good network to be able to get uh outside views really of other people that have had successes with those things so i think overcoming that fear of obsolescence by just dis discussing really the evolving role of legal professionals in this automated world highlighting the benefits then of sort of combining their human expertise with with automation all then helps towards this uh encouragement of cultural change really um and it has to start really with with fostering this culture of innovation and adaptability certainly that's what we found we, we really struggled until we sat down and actually I, I met with a vast number of our I'll say staff workforce partners directors secretaries receptionists everybody and just talk to them really um about what they thought about the firm what our culture was how frightened or not they were of the change and then and then we went on to try and recognize and reward creative problem solving and innovation encourage open dialogue um encourage collaboration across teams and in fact one of the things we had a bit of a a bonus there was we we relocated um under one roof rather than being in multiple buildings and that sort of cross collaboration really helped drive this culture of adaptability and change and so we sort of rode the the, the wave of that a little bit um so yeah i tried to engage with all levels of the organization in that change process and then develop a clear communicated vision for the firm really with a uh it's one of the few times i think a top down approach can work mm -hmm. um I'm not, I'm not a fan of ivory tower strategy but actually a top down approach to driving change and innovation really has to work so if they see the partners resisting automation and technology and um moving towards commoditized ends of work they will be as equally frightened as the as as, as partners may appear to be um and so it's about it's about driving it from the top really so yeah that, that was our experience that, that we had in uh, sort of a decade or so ago i think we'll speak a lot to this change management cultural change aspect uh, in the second half of the discussion as well but i just wanted to come to you mike for your take on because we've talked about gap analysis we've talked about you know identifying where firms can automate i mean one of the biggest questions would be can i can i automate that can i automate that and i'm sure as a supplier you're probably often not at the other end of the conversation saying yes you can you know that's a, it's a fairly simple thing to do so where do you think the blockers come in then um, yeah, yeah. So again, just just to your point there, I, I think from a supplier's perspective, um, we, we're there to help you also through that journey. Understand, or we should be. If your suppliers are not, then that's a different conversation. But it's in our interest to work with you in that early stages to identify the the the, the areas of potential automation and how we could achieve that. Because the earlier we are involved the more likely we are able to provide more engaging and more realistic expectations. Um, and so that's one thing that we would absolutely always recommend and, and, and would almost sort of issue as part of a best practice. Let's, let's engage the suppliers, whether that's the incumbent or some potential new players, uh, suppliers because they've got some automation capabilities that might be of interest. The earlier you, you involve them, I think you will get more from them as a trusted advisor or a partner in that process. Um, in terms of some of the blockers, I think that this might come back to the magic wand question at, towards the end. But I think as, as a firm, as an individual working within that firm, if you're uh, open to automation and for areas of your role where that can uh, really add value, you're probably going to look for one solution that does everything for you, or well, that would be the ideal. But in truth, in practice, that's just not the case. Um, I mean, we have a, a multi-year um, roadmap around automation in place at the moment, but it's specific to certain areas of automation within legal. It's not the entire end-to-end -end, um, matter process, should we say. So I think it's understanding where automation can be adding value. And unfortunately, that may mean multiple suppliers uh, in, in some cases to help you achieve that, but engage them that we're, we're all grown ups, we're all adults, and we want to work together to make this a success. Because if we can make this a success for you, there's nothing stopping us being, then you being a great reference for us to work with another supplier at other firms. So it's about making it work for you. And, and I think so the block has come down to the change management piece we've talked about, and that's coming a bit later on, and I've got some other thoughts around that. Um, but I think also it's just understanding that 
we're coming into this with a mindset of we've still identified where automation is going to be valuable. And I think one of Sean's points of the first question he answered was absolutely the most sensible approach to doing this in the gap analysis process. Identify what we want to automate, where we want our business to be on that spectrum, how are we going to get there, and then who do we need with us on that journey. That's that's where we can be of value, but also going into that with a mindset that there isn't going to be a one-stop shop to do that for everybody. I, I think that's important. Although that is the ideal, I think it, in, in reality, it's important understanding that there are going to be multiple parties involved in making this a success. Mm-hmm. Um, and speaking of success, I mean, before we move on to this whole change plan piece, if I could follow up with you, Mike, I mean, do you have any any models that you use to help firms understand the returns that they might be getting on automation, for example, when they are piloting solutions or if they are, you know, trying to in- sell internally the value mm-hmm. outside of the whole relationship with the supplier and between the supplier and the firm. If firms are trying to sell internally the value of automation, do you have mm-hmm. something that can help them in terms of where they should look for a good return? Yeah, so um, some very intelligent people that's not me uh, have worked on various sort of ROI calculators. We've sat down with many firms who have adopted our solutions um, focused on automation uh, and in order to, for them to, to be able to sell that internally, as well as us to be able to show that value to them initially, we had to come up with some models that help us do that. Um, so we've got so, so an ROI calculator that can help with that. And I'm caveating that with, our area of expertise around automation for legal is document automation. Mm -hmm. So whilst there are other areas on the spectrum, we are heavily focused on the document automation piece. And they all tie back to something that's already been mentioned, which is efficiency, that high volume, sometimes high value, but also low value, repeatable work that you as individuals within the firm have to repeat on a very regular basis to create and, and uh, the, the documents and information you're looking for, we have the tools and models that will help us identify, well, this is how long it's taking you to do that each time today, multiplied by the number of individuals in the firm that's doing that today. Then with our solution in place, we can look to reduce that down to whatever X looks like. And that can be um, measured out across the year, across the business, uh, and you can apply monetary values to that as well. I know the the time billing piece was mentioned earlier, but not all administrative document creation tasks are billable. So if we could automate with a focus on those ones, giving you more time back and to be more efficient and focus on those billable activities, I think that's another way that you can position it to help from change management, selling internally, um, deploying and adopting the solutions that, that, that the firm is looking to implement. <clears throat> right. Thank you for that, Mike. And I, I, I'll come to you now, Lindsay. I mean, obviously, there is that aspect of, uh, as Mike said, that there is so many ways to measure the returns. But um, going back to something he said was that there, it is never going to be a one-stop shop solution for automation. Um, could you give us, as someone who's been through this journey, could you give us some detail on what aspects of your firm you've actually automated and what the challenges have been with respect to what Mike was talking about is that there is no one-stop shop solution. So you've had to probably have quite a mix then. Yeah, of course. Um, So I'm sure we all have a case management system in place. We've got document automation there. um, But then what we've wanted to do is obviously automate different elements of the legal process. And to do that, we have had to use different suppliers. Um, our challenges have been getting the suppliers to talk to each other um, and integrating um, the two to the case management system. Um, we have had successes. Um, we are with a, a CMS that are willing to talk to their parties and put in place the API so that they can integrate. Um, and there are some elements that are working really, really well, that's saving a lot of time. Um, but we do still have some suppliers that we're using um, for, you know, in different departments that cannot plug into our case management system. So that just that ends up creating additional time because any work that you're doing on another system, you obviously need to download it and put it onto the case management system so that we've got everything in one place. Um, where we've got third parties that 
you know, where there is an API in place with our case management system, everything automatically drops into the CMS. Um, all of the information is populated into third party software. So it does save so much time. And, and until all of those third party suppliers will talk to each other and integrate, we're going to have a problem because we're not um, automating. As I said earlier, we haven't got automation in all of our departments yet. Um, so if we start going out to market to look at that, we are we are going to have a problem with our staff and, and change management and getting people on board when they think, well, you know, I've got to use a different system. I've got to log into there. Then I need to download it, you know, upload it into the CMS. They can't really see how it's saving time if, if they're having to spend 10, you know, use 10 clicks in, instead of two. Um, so, yeah, we are having challenges with third parties not talking to, to each other. But some are, I do think some are really willing. Um, and there are so many different platforms out there and so much um, legal technology. But it is just finding a solution. And that will come down to the magic one question at the end um, of getting them all to talk to each other and integrate because it will make our lives so much easier. But is it the case that in some cases the efficiency benefits of automating a specific function or, or bringing in a certain piece of technology would be offset by the inefficiency of then having of it not integrating? Um, probably not, but it, it doesn't help with um, getting buy-in from the staff. So I can see a system that we're using in one department where there is no integration with the case management system. Um, it is, they are having to spend additional time and then sometimes the file on the CMS doesn't reflect everything because it comes down to human error you know if you're not if you're forgetting to download something and, and upload it into the cms whereas those systems where we have got full integration the fiana doesn't even need to think about it they they can just log on get everything done that they need to do and they know that everything is being dropped into their file um, and also going into the, an app for the client they don't have to do anything else they can just simply complete the document and they don't need to think about it. Um, whereas those systems that don't have the integration, there's that, those extra steps that BNRs, um or support staff will have to take. And you could end up forgetting things, um, you know, forgetting to upload things. And then that will cause problems at the when you come to review a file or at the end of the file and you realize that some things are missing. So I don't think... Um, yeah, it's not a huge problem, but it just doesn't help with trying to get buy-in from staff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and again, it'd be great to come back to this idea of buy-in, and we probably will. But Andy, I just wanted to bring this whole integration question to you as well. Is it something that you've dealt with, and and is there something that uh, is it something that has also deterred certain investments for you? Um, yeah, I think there's there's a lot of technologies out there. I think one of the things that you know me size law firm struggle was getting access to these technologies so all of a sudden apis came along and you know there's all of a sudden there's a, there's a load in the market well what we've tend to find is as we're doing reviews and trying to think you know is this the one for us when you then put products side by side some overlap some don't overlap at all others have got a wider array some have got a really narrow um sort of what they can deliver and all of a sudden you find yourself in this quandary and this headache of you know which technology is right um, and it becomes quite frustrating. You have like different experiences for other people around the business who've used them through either different law firms or from the fact they've had a client that deals with it in this way that there's, that's dealing with us. And it's it, all of a sudden it, it makes the waters very muddy to decide on which one's the best one. So it's great that we've got all these technologies, but actually it's, it ends up posing more questions. And then you end up with that infighting with, well, that doesn't work for, for my department. Yeah. Um it works for another one and it's just like well how do you bring that then into the firm and you don't want too too many technologies because all of a sudden then you're gonna you're gonna lose people so technically can you deal with it and then culturally can people handle this amount of integrations and different ones if they do something different mm -hmm. um so that in itself does cause a problem and we have seen that with certain technologies as we have been you know reviewing the processes you know is this one right for us yes or no and then you go through that, that appraisal and it's just like well what are they what are they offering and sometimes there's there's too much choice and then there's just something that doesn't quite fit the bill at all right and it's it is about that stakeholder management then and is that something that you have a strategy for when it comes to choosing a technology i mean as you said there's so many out there so how do you go about that decision yeah i think one of them is you know 
what what is the best of breed and and also what are our competitors using because one of the things is it's great when we have someone on the other side who's got technology in place they work at a quick pace they deliver the information in a certain way so if you can have if you can use those same sort of technologies that helps everyone because it speeds up a transaction versus somebody that uses something that's not quite you know um a, you know a decent market uh, level uh, product because that, that can make things difficult as well for us so we've had that with certain in- integrations of information for for downloading um so i think part of it comes into you know you know what what is that technology you know where's it going in the in the market that's what makes our decision you know we bring in everyone else but ultimately it does come down to you know the management's decision on, on which product it is mm-hmm. And uh, if I could bring the same question to you, Sean, in terms of the integrations aspect, I'm sure there's there's a whole other conversation to be had there, which I, it'd be great to hear your thoughts on that, because is that something that you've dealt with, especially in a firm where, you know, you might be more towards the bespoke side or you might have a more equal ratio of bespoke to commoditized work? How is it that you've gone about the whole integration conversation then? Um, usually pulling my hair out, to be honest, <laughs> Ateb. Um, it, it, it's a tricky one. The same challenges that Lindsay and Andy have mentioned, really. I, I think there is no question, I think, that the lack of integration between products uh, is, a, is a huge barrier to automation adoption, just generally. Um, there, there's the resourcing of multiple platforms and supporting those multiple platforms, which is very hard, which, again, Lindsay was, was sort of touching on. It's not just training and resistance from the support staff is literally at the back end, ops team, IT team, um, developing, managing, learning, programming in all of these products is very difficult um, for, for an SME law firm. It's fine if you're huge. It's not so fine if you're, uh, you know, if you're, if you're a one to five million pound turnover of legal practice, it's it's hard to get those resources. So it does, it does definitely hinder progress. Um, I think there is some increasing, I, I've certainly witnessed it myself, some increasing collaboration between um technology suppliers uh, i think it's probably something mike mike will touch on and i think there is some movement in the industry towards uh, standardizations of, of of processes and communications and, and, and layouts however that's a very long-term project so in the short term there is this there is this barrier of standardization of, of, between products and making them talk to each other and we like other firms have got silos data silos which causes us problems for gdpr it causes a problem for a host of things to make sure we're compliant um we have had some um gains from various software suppliers in 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 closing some of those gaps with with standardizations and integrations and and some have been kind enough to develop some bespoke solutions but um the problem with those is they become proprietary mm-hmm. uh, and, and then when one of the products is updated um they stop talking to each other <laughs> So it, it can become a sort of constant source of, of, of um, maintenance, really, which is problematic. Again, it sort of hurts the SME legal sector, really. Um, so, yeah, uh, but, but I think where we have had some help from legal software providers, they've provided some great case studies some demonstrations. Uh, Mike's been talking about ROI metrics that he uses to showcase that value of automation. And we've actually found that quite useful. And, and we brought a, a new product on board recently with automating in our commercial property area. Um, I'll, I'll give them a shout out. They, they, I'm not a paid, <laughs> not a paid advocate, but it's called Orbital Witness. And it's something that there has been a really great automation tool for, for our teams to do, do simple mapping that used to take us a very, very long time, you know, hours or days, is now a minutes job. Um, and so they are out there. However, this is back to Lindsay's point, that doesn't integrate with my CMS. So I've got a, another data silo right there. So yeah, go, going best of breed is really hard right now. Um, and hopefully in 10 years, it'll be different, but maybe we'll have all retired by the time the industry has changed. I don't know. Right. And I think, I mean, linking this whole thing, the, the whole aspect to people. I mean, as you mentioned, one of the first things you said was integration is a change management challenge. But is it also, I mean, is automation at, at any point, uh, I'll start with you, Sean, and uh, this is the second round, and sorry, before I do, actually, I might remind everyone who's tuning in to please do ask your questions because I'm, I'm, I'm doing my best to extract as much information as I can from this lovely panel, but please do. I mean, I'm sure you have your own experiences and you'd like to hear their thoughts on them, so please do uh, post in the Q&A and I can pose the questions to the panel. Uh, but Sean, I think... Uh, Coming to the people side of it, linking it to the people side of it, there's there's so many aspects to when you are automating with we've thought that's a little bit about the the cultural aspect of it, the fact that people feel like automation might demean their work, but there's also the fact that the, the flip side of it that it might 
aid the whole talent attraction and retention challenge that is happening at the moment. It might aid with retaining people. It might play differently with different clients. You know, I mean, clients, some clients might be very happy to automate certain aspects of their journey, whereas other, others might not be at all. So I'm wondering if it's, how do you kind of approach that people side of it in, in on, on all aspects? It's a vast spectrum, isn't it? It, it? it definitely was one that started with conversations, very non-threatening information filing conversations um, so, that, so that we could establish really honestly on the ground what everybody thought, not what the partners thought, not what the executive board thought, but what the staff doing the work <laughs> all, all thought. Um, and to and to try and present to them really this this encourages open dialogue and, and and by the way that's a real challenge for legal practices I think is to have genuine open dialogue within within traditional mindsets of law firms um, they tend to be slightly hierarchical uh, they, they they tend to to be a lot of a lot of um, fear to speak one's mind um, both from lawyers by the way and support staff I, I think people don't like to feel like they're in the out group. If they have a different opinion, I think lawyers like to club together, generally speaking, on sweeping statement. But I think you know, they like to be part of the, of a collective group. So um, this sort of uh, encouraging mentorship and, and knowledge sharing within our firm and within our legal community and establishing. Um, we tried to establish when we were doing this uh, sort of communities of practice. Um, so not just speaking to a team. But we would bring the private client teams together. We would bring the, the, the contentious work together. So rather than sort of talk to them as a family team, a uh, litigation team, a PI team, you know, just bring those together. So establish those communities of practice, foster this culture of continuous learning up and down the entire uh, chain of, of, of the firm, really, um, and then really develop genuine in-house training programs on legal tech. Mm -hmm. um, Law firms sometimes struggle, I think, to get the right attitude and 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 um, knowledge across when it comes to learning how to use these systems effectively and the benefits they can bring. So um, we also try to encourage attendance at external industry conferences and workshops so that they heard it not just from from us, from me, from from our executive board, but we we try to create enough critical mass of of positive thinking. Um, advocates for, for change um, to drive it forward. And, and that's really how, how we sort of create this nucleus, which then when it became large enough, people gravitated towards it slightly more. Um, even the partners, I'm going way back in the way back time machine. So 20 years ago, I recall sticking a PC on a partner's desk who looked at me and said, why are you giving me that? I'm not a secretary. Um, you know, as well, it's not just there for typing. Uh, but that attitude, of course, is long, long, long gone. Um, but I think it's at the far end of, of the extreme that sort of says underlying everything, there is this challenge of roles changing. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it's that whole thing of information sharing, information gathering and external views on what's going on. That That's certainly what we were finding was was helpful. Mm -hmm. I'll come to you, Mike, in a second about the culture and people's uh, the change management side of it. But I, I just wanted to hear from Andy and Lindsay, actually, as, as firms that have uh, that are fairly, fairly far along on automating certain aspects of their business, um, how that has played with with people within the firm and in terms of uh, talent, has it has it improved the experience? Have you been able to hear any positive stories from that? And and also clients, I mean, have, have, have clients responded well or not responded so well? And have there been any, any stories in that department? Uh, maybe I'll start with you, Lindsay. Um, yeah, so client-wise, we have had um, many clients, you know, be willing to use um, some of the apps that we've put in place. Um, we do get the odd client that's not happy um, to do that, but, you know, they are the minority. Um, we've had new staff. We've had recruited quite a lot, actually, in the last 12 months. And what's been really nice is having them actually say to us after their induction process how much they like the technology. Um, because over, I'd say, the last sort of five years, it has been a challenge trying to change the mindsets of staff and, and get everyone on board. Um, and then when you have new people come into the firm, we carry out a full induction process, ensure they have training um, internally from us, but we also put them on the external courses with the providers. Um, and then they have come, turned around and said to us that, yeah, the, I really like the technology. It makes life so much easier. 
Um, it's a lot better than what it was in my, my previous firm. And we found as well that some of the um, staff that we've, had, we've recruited recently, they've actually used some of the systems, but they haven't used them to the full potential. So they have had um, an element of training on, on some of the systems that we're using. And, and they say, oh, well, I used it for this or I used it for this, but we didn't use it from start to finish like we are. And I think that that's um, a problem in a lot of smaller firms. It's, it is having the time to sit down and, and work out from the beginning of the process to the end on, on what can be automated. And I think initially firms will just opt for the most simple ones, um, you know, like onboarding, um, a lot of post-completion work I know is being automated in firms now. And it is just, it's the middle gap that I think that um, firms may struggle with if, if you haven't got the time. And whereas we haven't got, you know, dedicated people that work on the case management system or a dedicated IT team, it is me. Um, so it is a, a case of having to look through the whole process and see what you can automate and make sure that you do it really because staff staff do enjoy it once they once they've had the right training and they actually start using it they realize the time that it can save um and yeah and it is nice to have staff give you that feedback although we have had you know, the odd um odd feedback from staff where they haven't enjoyed the technology they don't want to move into the modern world and they want to do things the way that they used to and and unfortunately for them, you know, it's not the right place for them because we are moving forward with technology. We're not going backwards. Um, but the majority of staff have given us good feedback and, and enjoy the systems. <clears throat> and before I bring this to you, Andy, we do have a couple of questions in the Q&A. So I'm going to pose this to the panel in general. Um, start with the first one. I think this speaks a bit to the commercial cross purposes that sometimes uh you know, exists between law firms and suppliers, but I'll, ex I'll allow anyone to comment on it if they like to. So the first question is, is it not the case that CMS providers do not allow open data as it affects them charging more? I mean, that speaks to obviously the commercial cross purposes. So I'm wondering if anyone, in including Mike, would like to speak to that or comment uh, to that specifically. Um, I'll start. I, I, I can see why that's probably a view. Um, I'll, I'll defend Mike slightly here. I, I think I think there there may be some aspect to that. I think in in reality, from my experience, when we've been trying to integrate, it comes down just more to the difficulties of the bespoke nature of data sets um, and and database tables and conversion tables. Um, it, it, it's not as as simple as I, I think. Speaking on behalf of some suppliers that I've worked with as um, uh, unwilling or trying to be protectionist ab about things. I think over time, systems have just developed um, customization options and um, complexities that are just very hard to integrate with third party products or vice versa. Um, I have some sympathy with it. What one, one does feel is, uh, as I think, AI and technology develops over time where, where solutions are going to be easier to develop than perhaps they have been in the past um might assist but um i i'm i'm marginally sympathetic to the problem but yeah it, it is one that does feel protections and i think there are some out there that are doing it in relation to keeping their customer base um trapped within their product i'm, I'm sure that might happen somewhere um i can't name one by the way i'm just saying i'm sure that possibly happens but uh yeah i think technological challenges and just customization and complexity issues really uh, are what i've foreseen or what i've seen rather um when we've been trying to integrate. Mm -hmm. um, right, thank you for that, Sean, and thank you, Dinesh, for that question. I think I'll move on because we're having a couple of other questions, so I'm just going to try and fit those in. Um, we have a question from Wayne Lord. Um, interestingly, it seems one of the key challenges is integration, which is a familiar subject. Um, are the Tigers finding that it's the CMS that it isn't integrating or the third-party software? Um, and also, are, there, are any of the Tigers firms putting pressure on these software vendors to improve the integration. I think I'll pose that to you, Lindsay, uh, given that you talked about the CMS integration challenges. Yeah, we find that our CMS provider is actually very open um, to having negotiations and you know talking to other third parties. I think the problem that um, the other suppliers have is that there are so many case management systems out there and mm. it's hard for them to integrate with one. Um, and not another. And there are obviously different requirements for different CMS systems. So yeah, I'm 
I don't know the technology behind it, but I'm sure it's very difficult for them to integrate into into one and, and then another. I'm sure the requirements are not exactly the same. Um, we have found some suppliers are, are willing to have those discussions, but I think there's just there's a barrier for them because there is so much work that needs to be done behind the scenes to actually get them to talk to each other. And one thing that we're really trying to do at the moment is our CMS system provides um, the facility for our clients to have an app where they can log in, they can check the status of their cases, um, they can view documents, upload documents and so on. But a third party provider that we're using, we're, we already use their app. Um, and what we don't want to do is ask clients to download two different apps. And what we need the two suppliers to do is actually integrate into one app so that our client can just download download the one app and get functionality from both systems that's a huge project but um it would save our clients but it'd be i think it'd be really good um for our clients as a selling point because they'd be able to log in and see absolutely everything they need to do complete their id checks do their own on um their onboarding but to i think for the providers behind the scenes there is so much work that needs to go into that and I'm just one of their clients that uses a CMS system mm. and I'm sure they've got you know thousands more that are using different different systems and there are different requirements for them all mm -hmm. um, but we do put a lot of pressure on our CMS system I have conversations with our account manager all the time um, to try and integrate with the different third parties and then we do the same with the third, third party providers as well so yeah, it is something I push, but there is resistance sometimes because I just think the level of work that they've got to do behind the scenes to actually make it work. Right. We have so much to cover in the last few minutes, so I'm just going to try and do as much of it as possible. Uh, Mike, before I, I mean, there's a couple more questions to pose to the panel, but before I do that, I want to come to you for the whole change management, management piece. I knew you, you had some ideas around that. It'd be great to hear them. Yeah, yeah, certainly. So, I mean, being on the supplier side, we, we have these conversations daily with existing customers, prospective customers, um, when they're interested or already using our solutions. Now, uh, I personally have been involved in numerous um, what we call awareness sessions. And this, I think, is aimed directly at addressing some of the resistance to the, the changes that may be coming for the users. Um, and the reason some of them or, or a lot of them are resistant is because they get told one Monday morning that there's a whole new system that they've got to work with. They may have had some initial training previously, but it could have been a week, a month or six months before it was actually released. So it, they, they've forgotten about it. So we we strive to engage them as early on as possible once the firm has made the decision that this is the solution that they're going to move forward with. And I personally have been asked to come in to sit down with groups of individual users within the business through multiple sessions throughout the day, just giving them that 15, 20 minute high level overview of what the system is, why the firm's made that decision and how it's going to add value and benefit them. And I think if you bring that in to if you're bringing those the user base into those discussions into the the whole process um, at that stage, it's not as scary as it could be on day one of go live of a brand new solution. Um, so making keeping the, the the firm aware, I think um, Andy mentioned it earlier. It's people engagement. I think it's related to mm. that, not just once the firm's made a decision on a new solution, but actually engaging the people in identifying why we need a new solution. It's users and, and Sean touched on it. I guess against all aspects of the business, not just the partners, the board, the, the, the secretarial staff, the support staff, the paralegals, everybody that's going to be using those systems, it's important that they're engaged in that. Um, and I think ultimately, one last point, it's when delivering um, some training or some awareness sessions around uh, a new solution that's coming for, for the users, it's using the right language language that's relevant to them and, and what they're used to working with or hearing. Um, focusing on the value, the benefits, whatever that may be, efficiency, time saving, more billable time back, whatever that equates to for them or for you as a firm. But tying it all back to a value, a benefit that they are personally going to recognise, again, with the ability to demonstrate that, of course, 
that I think will ease a lot of the the uh, the restraint that a lot of users can 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 show when they're being told there's a new system coming. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, Mike. I appreciate it. And uh, we do have the magic one questions to go get to, but I'm just going to pose one last question. I think I'll take this to you, Andy, given that both our other panelists have answered questions so far. Uh, Thomas Rayner, he says, great discussion. Thank you to the panel. A question on adoption of tech, the ongoing use of the automation after implementation. Um, do you have any tips, tricks, processes, policies to ensure adoption and deliver that target, target uh, return on investment? I guess part of that goes to what I said earlier on is sort of, you know, once that project's finished, you know, following it up and making sure it's review, review, review. Um, I think what we found is and when it comes to looking after solutions is things change as well. So what's relevant yesterday when we built the solution might change tomorrow. So I think that's one of the struggles that we have with our um, our developers that they're constantly going through that that feedback loop, making sure that it's, you know, fit for purpose you know, moving forward, because that's one of the things that tends to fall by the wayside. You, you get that, you know, piece of technology integrated, it's working great, and you just leave it and just let it die a death, <clears throat> sort of withers on the vine, so to speak. So what you need to do is you need to be, you know, how does it, how does it relate to the work that we're doing and, and what needs to happen with it, you know, and it's that constant, just, you know, improving what's there uh, to the point where you bin it off and you, you start again. Uh, and that's, that's really how we've used some of our technologies and it's worked quite well, but um you know that feedback from the users of you know how it's being used and then you know that that updating part is, is crucial to it because you know we're in a fast faster uh, fast moving world now so people expect stuff to work properly and be up to date mm -hmm. so it's that constant engagement from both sides there really right brilliant sorry good i was about to say uh, and i think just feed into that it it's time it takes a lot of time so you know part of this comes down to why is picking what's the biggest win for the business as well um, mm -hmm. Because you can get overwhelmed as well with resource uh, if you have got too too much of that going on as well. Right. Thank you for that, Andy. And brilliant. Uh, thank you to the whole panel. I just, we have two minutes left and I'm just going to come around the room uh, for what we call our magic wand questions as part of LPM Tiger Team. So I'm going to ask each of you to in 30 seconds, if, if you had a magic wand, what is the one problem you would fix or one thing you would achieve uh, within the scope of automation and within reason, of course? Um, well, or not, given that you have a magic wand. Uh, who would like to start? Why don't okay. we start with you, Sean? Go ahead. Um, yeah, I, I don't mind. So, so uh, 30 seconds, crikey. Um, uh, I'm going to put my wand to really hard use. So I would create an AI-powered, fully integrated legal platform that uh, encompasses comprehensive range of features, uh, including client centricity and upholding legal ethics. I think you said magic wand, so I can do anything, right? <laughs> so um, I'd have AI-driven case management with seamless collaboration tools, lots of integration, legal research automation integrated with that, along with a client portal and automated legal drafting. So if Mike would like to get on with that, that would be great. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, there you go. Some feedback as well there from Mike. Uh, Lindsay, magic wand, what are you doing? And very similar to Sean. Um, I would like one legal platform that pulls everything all into one place. So you've got your legal drafting, you've got your document autom automation, um, but also a marketing and system, because that's one thing that none of them do. Um, so, yeah, putting everything all into one, one system, which is something that I've, I think I've made clear earlier it would make all of our life so much easier great brilliant andy it sounds like everyone's been down to diagon alley and bought all the ones uh, <laughs> with, with those two requests um i think mine is 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 the data itself so you know how it's cleansed how it's used you know what we do with it next it's expensive it's time consuming uh, and i think really you know how do we start off that journey with a client and just making sure that we can capture all that information once uh, and it's correct across all platforms and you know with parties you integrate with as well so yeah the client rocking up with the qr code scan it and you get on with it you know we, we can uh you know short circuit our lives and just uh you know move forward with our legal matter would be fantastic brilliant thank you mike uh, I, I think my magic wand is uh, is to be the supplier that creates the system that that Sean and Lindsay and Andy have uh, have just referred to. Um, but no, more, more seriously, I, I I think it comes back to something I said earlier, for, purely from our perspective, and it is a relatively selfish one. It's being involved as early as possible with the customers, with the clients that are going through this process 
today. Um, the more information that we get, the more information that we can help <laughs> you identify in making those decisions that you need to make, because we do this with lots of firms. I know you you tend to have focused on your firm, quite rightly so, and you will talk to others around you, but we have experiences of doing this several times, many, many times with, with firms that we have helped and worked with to date. So use our experience, use our knowledge. Whilst we don't have the intimate knowledge of your firm and how you work, we have put things into practice that may help the way that your firm is, is aspiring to, to, to be. All right, brilliant. Right, so we're a couple of minutes over time, so that it really is all we have time for today. I know there are a couple, there is a question in the Q&A that we didn't get to, so apologies for that, but please do email that across and I'll try and get that over to the panel to start off a discussion at a later stage. But uh, a big thank you to everyone who joined us today for this discussion on automation. A big thank you to our panelists, Andy, Sean, Lindsay and Mike. Uh, and a big thank you to NetDocuments for partnering with this with this ongoing series, solving some of the key challenges in SME legal businesses. Thank you very much for joining us today.